I'm Ben Schneiderman, Associate of Computer Science uh, and Founding Director of the, I of the HCIL. Uh, this is part of the 30th anniversary celebration of HCIL, uh, and we're very pleased by that. We've handed out uh, some of the postcards of our announcement of our annual symposium coming up for our celebration for May 22nd, 23rd. The current director is Jen Goldbeck, and I also want to point to and thank John Froelich, who was helpful in organizing uh, today's event and all the other events. Uh, and so we've had uh, great interest. And I'm curious where people are coming from. How many people are part of the iSchool as students or faculty? All right, that looks like about, I guess, two thirds. Computer science? Oh, another good crowd of computer science students. Uh, uh, where both? else? Engineering? We have engineering? A business? I know there's a business, right? Okay. <laughs> what other departments or colleges are represented? Education. History. History, thank you. Nice. Education. Education, thank you, Tamara. What yeah. else? Liberal arts. Li liberal arts? Yeah. I didn't know there was a college. You mean the arts and humanities? Right. Art. All right. Um, and and uh, increasingly, these interdisciplinary topics are great fun to bring you. together thank different you. types of people, and HCIL has been sort of key player in bridging and making that interdisciplinary activity happen, which is just very satisfying and great to see a full house here. And so thank you for that. Uh, I think we're going to begin. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Morn Alman. I hope you've seen the poster. Uh, he is as tall as we've had to advertise. Uh, oh, I'm not very tall in that poster. I'm not sure what you mean. <laughs> if you want to play basketball all the time, he's your guy. Uh, but more importantly, he's your guy because from his graduate work in computer science at, at uh, Stanford is when I first came to know his work. And as I read his papers one by one on photography and geotagging, I kept saying, that's a great paper. I wish I had written that. And he consistently not only had innovative ideas, built real systems, fielded them in practical ways, and evaluated them in a way that gave you a convincing sense that this was something important and new. He's come to the East Coast, uh, so in the continuing discussions of East Coast, West Coast, uh, we have uh, win. <laughs> we won over for the moment <laughs> uh, for more, and he's in the New York area. He's assistant professor uh, at uh, Rutgers University, and he's also co-founder and the CTO of a new company that he's going to talk about, uh, and his continuing sort of innovative and adventures himself is called Mahaya or Machaya, depending on what your <laughs> ethnic uh, uh, leanings are, but I think we'll probably come to that discussion. And he also heads in Rutgers the Social Media Information Laboratory, or Interaction? Information. information. It says information. I'll explain. Right. right. <laughs> and so uh, he's been leading the effort at Rutgers in their version of the iSchool to create a stronger interest in social media. I see crowds coming, so I don't know if people can move forward. If everybody can move forward one foot, here we go. Let's try that. Let's try it. Everybody move forward one foot, and that one. Oh, this is great. <laughs> this is such a, it's Vine. Where's Vine? <laughs> awesome. Much better, much better. All right. Uh, I wasn't sure that was going to work, but it worked great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to uh, get this on Vine, but uh, it wasn't fast enough. <laughs> all right, so now that you're all in good spirits, I present more Naman for the talk. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ben and John, for inviting me, uh, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Indeed, I'm going to show some of the systems that we built recently in my group in the last few years. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hi, my name is Moore. Uh, um, I'm particularly, I'm going to stick with social media, uh, so let's roll with it, let's, let's start. Let me start with, uh, with the higher level, uh, some higher level uh, thoughts. And, you know, a lot of people have drawn the comparisons between the printing press and social media, right? It's become uh, a cliche to talk about this right now, but I wanted to highlight uh, uh, one specific element uh, in that I think uh, is, uh, matches both the printing press and social media that people tend to overlook. So a lot of people talked about the enhanced velocity of uh, communicating and disseminating information that's, that, was, uh, that was brought by the printing press and is now brought by social media at a, at a different scale. Um, and that uh, in turn created uh, all kinds of 
uh, effect in the real world. So Benedict Anderson talks about how uh, printing press enshrined languages and created nations and so forth, yeah. and everything other than Malcolm, uh, sorry, I think everyone other than Malcolm Gladwell uh, seemed to <laughs> think that there was some role that's been played in the revolutions in Arab Spring by social media. So. Um, the, the speed of communicating uh, and dissemination helped, you know, move the world in some direction for, for good and bad. And there's another thing that is common to both, and that's the development of authorship. And authorship played a strong role in both authorship and the speed of communication made people want to produce and disseminate printed work, books. And now it helps people, motivate people to contribute and post things on social media. And Taken together, they lower the barriers and raise the motivations, I wish I knew who came up with that phrase, uh, in this context, to uh, produce information and make it available. And in turn, that information is being made permanent and archived in various ways. So in the book uh, case, because of the, new, the low barriers and increased motivations, um, we had a wave of books that were created, 20 million in the first century of the printing press and then 200 million by the end of the next century. Um, and those, the books, this archive altered the way, our, altered our society in, in a meaningful way. It archived for the first time the memories, the stories, uh, the uh, information, the beliefs that people had. Um, and they were now available to uh, examine and look back at. So, which in turn, you know, enabled things like, you know, help the Renaissance ha happened and, and advance uh, science in various ways. It changed the way we study and know history. It did all kinds of stuff. So now we're creating a new archive. It's no longer the book's archive. We're creating, you know, if the printing press moved us from oral history to uh, printed and archived history, the social media is moving us from lived experiences to uh, captured and archived experiences. So we have a new archive of experiences that is available. Uh, so this new archive needs new uh, systems and methods. So you know, even in the days of the uh, early days of the books, people started talking about the information overload and how these archives are unmanageable. Uh, and Blair from Harvard talks about uh, the information overload that predates modern times even. Um, and in the days of the book, they came up with various uh, systems like index cards, like libraries, the Dewey system, encyclopedia, reference books, page numbers even were invented. So all kinds of technology were invented to handle that. Is it similarly critical to develop this set of tools for managing the new uh, archive of human experience? My lab uh, thinks that uh, it is critical, and this is what we want to find out, is the right set of tools to uh, manage the data in that uh, experience archive. So we want to make sense of this new and emerging source of information to make uh, this data more accessible and usable, uh, to use a Google phrase. Uh, for various groups, and I'm going to talk about mostly uh, consumers and journalists as our target groups in this talk, but could be uh, other groups uh, like historians, scholars, uh, first responders that we did some work with, uh, and so forth. So doing that right, managing this information right, will have implications for, uh, for media, for social science, for the way we view and uh, relive our history, perhaps, for political science, for public health, and so forth. So doing this requires three, three types of work that we do in my lab. Um, first, uh, we do qualitative work, uh, small-scale study mostly that aim to uh, understand motivations and practices of people producing information in these social media environments. So we did a studying, uh, study of uh, motivations for tagging, uh, for study about uh, practices and sharing videos around live events, uh, studies of posting health-related information to Twitter and so forth. Second, we do larger scale, mostly quantitative studies uh, that are partly computational sociology, partly data mining, where we have an opportunity to look use that data, uh, model that data to look at relationships, attitudes, attention, interest uh, at a scale that was not available before. And third, and that's the uh, uh, focus on my talk today, is we create computational tools that allow for new experiences around uh, the consumption of social media data. 
how, how we can uh, allow access that's different than what's present, what, what you get from other systems and services. So this will be the focus of my talk today. And in particular, I'm going to focus on, on one today that's in the heart of social media information, uh, uh, which is uh, events, or live events, or real world events. So as you know, everything that happens gets recorded today in social media, uh, in real time, in retrospect, there's, all, there's you know, people post tweets, photos, uh, videos, vines, what have you. And I think it was uh, Susan Sontag that said that everything in the world exists to end up in the photograph. Does anyone know when she said that? 71, two. Uh, a little later than that, it was 77 when, she's, when she had that insight and that was uh, if anyone remembers film cameras, and it was really hard to take photos and develop, and it was costly, but still she said she, she saw that, and she saw it coming. Everything in the world exists to end up uh, in a photograph, and now, of course, in a tweet and in a Facebook status message and on YouTube. So people share content from real world events. Where does it end up? Uh, it ends up on uh, different social media sites. But it also represents, uh, at huge scale, our, our societies, our activities, our interests, what we do, how we vote in our, with our feet, where we show up, what, what we pay attention to. So those events may range from you know, widely known and popular ones, like the Radiohead concert, to uh, smaller events that don't rise to the national headlines. <laughs> uh, anybody spend enough time in San Francisco to know what this is? Uh, <laughs> if you consider, <laughs> this is on Lombard Street, uh, actually, it's called Bring Your Own Big Wheel. Uh, and it's an event where seemingly grown up men and women uh, ride uh, little uh, big wheel uh, toys uh, down Lombard Street, the famous uh, uh, curvy street, and get to the bottom and go back up. There's a lot of, a lot of alcohol is involved. Uh, and, so this guy is actually documenting as he's going down. Um, and of course, uh, more serious, significant events. Uh, you know, in the US, pepper spray at UC Davis, the Hurry Square, uh, larger scale events, and really everything else from the CSW conference to the Outside Lands uh, Music Festival. Right? People are just documenting it. So um, this project uh, uh, set out uh, um, because we felt that the experience around those uh, moments is broken, significantly broken. Let's see how, let's see outside lands. 40,000 people went to outside lands. They shared tweets and photos. You know, Stevie Wonder played and Reggie Watts played. Where's the record of that experience on the web? Let's go where we can see what happened. And if I type outside lands into Google, I get text of, you know, pages, schedule. There's no experience uh, there. I can go to Google Images. And, you know, I get the sense that uh, some of my favorite web banners were there. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people, but not much, uh, not much beyond that. Uh, on Twitter, you know, if I don't do it as the event is going on, I just get, you know, unrelevant tweets about next, uh, next year outside lands. Or even if I do do it during the event, there's so many tweets, it's hard to keep track. So in short, the experience, I'm not <laughs> impressed. So what do we do? How can we make this better? How can we organize uh, the world's memory? Uh, so the content is fragmented, presented in an unusual way, hard to find, hard to fix. So we want to create tools that will help you consume this information in meaningful ways. So I'm going to talk about uh, our work to create a better information environment around these events, starting from you know, a fire on 34th Street to the State of the Union address by uh, the president to the zombie apocalypse when, when, <laughs> when that happens. Are you the owner of zombies at Maryland now, right? Yeah. It's, uh, it's oh, great. Yeah. Uh, In the world. So. <laughs> uh, this, is, uh, uh, this project is sponsored by these generous bodies uh, and uh, is in collaboration with Luis Carvano of uh, Columbia University. So what kind of work uh, uh, we did, there's three uh, main uh, things that we were aiming for in this event, in this, uh, event work. So one, uh, so detect, identify, and organize. For detecting events, we want to 
you know, know when something is happening using social media data as an early alert system uh, and understand the nature of what's happening. So being able to distinguish from Justin Bieber got a haircut and, you know, there's a fire or, you know, the breaking event in Russia. Uh, the, we want to do that despite the uh, noise, the short format, uh, despite the scale of the data. Uh, so it becomes a challenge and we wrote a couple of papers about that. I'm not going to talk about this uh, today. We also want to identify the right content. So we want to be able to say this is all the content that was captured in the event, regardless of a hashtag or regardless of whatever other uh, conventions uh, they are. We want to get a complete picture uh, from multiple sources. So not just from one site, uh, but also from you know, Flickr, from Twitter, from Facebook, from YouTube, from Tumblr, all, that, uh, all the different sources from the web uh, and so forth. So we wrote a couple of things about that. I'm not going to talk about this today either. Uh, I'm going to mostly talk about the third challenge of once we get that data and identify it, how we can organize it to allow users to effectively explore, analyze, and experience an event in, uh, in new ways. Um, so we want to do that uh, uh, in a way that uh, makes sense for the specific tasks that I will describe and goals and needs of, of the users. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, three uh, systems that we build, uh, Vox, Sourcer, and Multiplayer. A drink. So the first two systems, Vox and Sourcer, are, uh, were written uh, this is joint work with Nick Diakopoulos, who was my postdoc student, were written for uh, a journalist, for media, uh, to interact with social media content. The last one, uh, multiplayer, is more consumer uh, type application. So for each of these, I'm going to talk about uh, how, uh, briefly go over how we generate the requirements for the design. I'm going to talk about the computation uh, elements that went into building the different interfaces. And I'm going to show how we evaluated uh, those uh, systems. So think of this talk as more of the uh, systems HCI talk slash information science. Uh, so we'll keep it on a high level, focus on the outcomes and the goals, and not so much on the technical details, which I know we can all find and read in the papers. So uh, Twitter. You know, when I started uh, working on this topic, I had to explain Twitter, but probably I'm safe skipping this, you know, <laughs> status messages, people, network, posting, <coughs> hashtags, maybe just go over hashtags. This is from the Gold Golden Globes uh, uh, event, and we identified these tweets. Well, I, here I searched Twitter for that hashtag, so we can see people posting uh, and saying that the tweet is about the Golden Globes using a hashtag. Um, but so any event now has the long stream of Twitter information, but I can very quickly get lost in this, right? There's, uh, the, the sheer volume makes extracting any kind of knowledge from this interface uh, pretty much prohibitive. So with uh, Nick, we were interested uh, to know how can this content that's created around a large scale media event, despite its scale, or maybe use its, its scale to uh, inform uh, broadcast news uh, to inform journalistic inquiry. Right, so that was uh, a question we want to see what kind of insight and analysis they want to perform with that kind of uh, data. That was early on around uh, 2009 or 2010 um, where we looked at that problem. So uh, here we were light on the design requirements. We uh, uh, rather has designed hypothesis that uh, was derived from the journalism and media literature. Uh, so we knew that uh, journalists tend to cover or like to cover divergent point of view uh, <coughs> and they uh, look at newsworthiness uh, as something that uh, favors uh, surprising content, unusual extremes of positive negative. This is what they're looking for, or at least the hypothesis was that this is what they're looking for in the content. So we build a series of computational tools that will allow them to direct their attention to relevant information in that content from Twitter that we captured around large-scale media events. Uh, in particular, we built uh, various tools, like for example, tools that estimated the relevance of the tweet to what's being uh, talked about. Uh, 
talked about the uniqueness, uniqueness of novelty of a specific tweet uh, in the context of the other tweets around, uh, shared around that time. Uh, we build uh, some crude sentiment, uh, estimate uh, if it's positive or negative, and we extracted uh, keywords over the time of the event as it was uh, happening. So again, uh, in the paper, there are the, de the details of how they were computed using some very uh, simple information retrieval uh, concepts and techniques. But let me show you how they were used uh, in the interface. So Nick uh, designed and built uh, this interface that we called Vox Civitas. And let me just talk about this for a second before I show you the demo. What you see uh, here is the volume of tweets over time. Um, you can see that we have about 100,000 tweets. I think we collected, this was during the Obama State of the Union in 2009 or 10. Uh, must have been 10, right, this first one. Um, and so this is the volume over time. These are a set of uh, keywords that, were, that we extracted that were significant at different points over that timeline of the speech. Uh, these are the tweets at any given moment. And there are a bunch of filters that we can apply that I'll show you in a second. And this all plays together with the video. Oh, it's, uh, all right. This is, ah, wrong. There you go. Uh, and my cursor, thank you. So here's the State of the Union. And the one thing that uh, I could do is to uh, click one of the words here, and it will filter. It will filter. It will filter. It, it did filter uh, the tweets to show the tweets that talk about this extracted topic. So delay in this case, if you remember, Obama wants the job, uh, the jobs bill on his desk without delay. That was the quote. Uh, I can further uh, filter that to show. You know, only tweets with uh, with links. You know, what do people link to when they when they talked about the delay? Uh, I can show our uh, retweets. <coughs> I can show uh, tweets that are quotes, and see how how much you know specific quotes, specific things that were said uh, resonated in that context and where. Uh, let me just I can clear the filters. Um, I can jump to a different point, uh, explore the sentiment. So if I click on the uninsured, for example, it will show me over time what was the sentiment that was associated with those uh, specific topics that, was, that were mentioned. Uh, I can find things that are more relevant to transcript or more uh, novel. I can also type in my own topic if it's not in the list and see what people, how <coughs> people responded uh, to the event. Uh, uh, in, in relation to that uh, you, is keyword. This, is this meant for retrospective analysis like we're doing here or just in the moment? This was meant for retrospective. There were uh, later requests for doing it in the moment. There's no reason why this cannot happen in real time. So, so we built uh, the prototype and actually let me talk, talk to you about the evaluation in a second. Of course, uh, very shortly after the Twitter analysis around real, real world event became a hot thing and also became went downhill very fast, uh, which instead now instead of the uh, analysis that we tried to uh, create where you can make informed, uh, uh, we can have some kind of an informed understanding of what's being shared and why, it all became like a competition and a popularity contest where people track the volume of tweets over time. So I found, uh, if you watch the debate of the previous election cycle at all, that's what, that's what you get to see in any uh, news media, uh, sadly. Uh, you know, it provides some idea of the response, but it doesn't allow you to reason about it in any meaningful way. Uh, What's interesting here is that you can see that there were 100,000 tweets per minute at the, uh, uh, at the height of the event. This was the debate from 2012, October 2012. And we had 100,000 tweets for the entire event just two years ago. So the scale of content is, is growing uh, in amazing, uh, amazing speed. 
So, can I ask you a yeah. Question? Ben. Can you say a word about uh, what is possible today, given what Twitter actually allows people to access? I, mean, I can't actually access all that from really tweets myself. Yeah. Right. I think uh, with the streaming API, the default is about 3,000 a minute. I think that's what we were able to get last year in 2011 for the Standard Union, uh, which is not whatever the two million so that's or the, like less than one percent. Uh, less than one percent, but assuming a random sample, enough content to reason about. Is that true? It's a random sample. Do you have any reason to believe that? I, just, I, mean, I have no idea. I have no reason to believe it's uh, huge. So it's. I'm sure it's biased in some way, not completely random. Uh, random in the sense that if we're not trying to generalize to scientific uh, results, we're trying to generalize, uh, trying to create a tool that exposes the information. I think it's random enough. That's that's the assumption. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't build surveys on top of that <laughs> sample. Um, I'm, I may and again I may be wrong, but the assumption is for information presentation. There is no reason to think that one uh, topic is uh, uh, prioritized over the, the other, or one type of people prioritized. You might be right, but I could also imagine some unintentional biases, like for example, North American tweets. Or more frequent than the Egyptian tweets, which would obviously have a big impact for certain events. Yeah, absolutely, for certain events, right? So again, I think, uh, and you can correct for that when when you get when you get the data, if you want to show divergent points of view, which it's already the bias is so inherent in Twitter already. I don't think the sample is what will make it. So I don't know if ways that the sample will actually make it a lot harder. So in all the works I'm going to talk about today, we did two kinds of uh, evaluations. Uh, one, uh, we do uh, a more uh, direct analysis of uh, the algorithmic outcome. So we, I talked about the few algorithmic methods that we used, and we actually do you know, computer science-like evaluation of whether we, did, you know, whether we uh, were successful in the algorithm to produce the outcome that we, uh, uh, we intended to. And then the second is where we do a more extensive qualitative evaluation of how users interact and what they glean out of the interfaces and the systems that we built for them. So this is usually, uh, it's either simulated in lab settings or done uh, uh, on the web in this case, uh, or can be done with the professionals at the places what, uh, where they work like we did in another case. So. Um, in the, I'm mostly going to talk about the, the second type of evaluation uh, today. You can read more. There's a, a famous uh, paper from uh, Olsen at WIST uh, 07. It talks about evaluation techniques for uh, computer science systems. Uh, I wrote a little bit about that in one of the papers uh, that I'm presenting today. So, um, the evaluation goals in this case, we want to see how effective it was to generate story ideas. We want to understand what kind of uh, insight and analysis were supported and what were interesting for journalists. And we wanted to see if, what are the shortcomings, what are the features that were used or needed uh, in this task. So we had uh, 18 participants through, recruited through the web. All were, uh, had uh, journalistic background, uh, either advanced students or journalists. And we asked them to explore the interface and develop two story, uh, uh, two pitches for stories, for newspaper stories about this event. So mostly open-ended questionnaires. Uh, we asked for the responses, and we did content analysis on uh, whatever they uh, produced. So, uh, and the results highlight, you know, a few ways that the journalists find that uh, presentation uh, interesting. So, for example, the quote and retweet filters we used a lot, and they used to uh, figure out, you know, how people, um, um, you know, what resonated the most with the public. So they, they got that they can see that kind of information. Uh, the keyword uh, analysis that we had in the bottom also helped them understand the topics and the response. Uh, to the topic, so they could the, the, the news uh, angle was that they looked at the response and they tried to understand what people were saying, or what were the comments, or <coughs> quote unquote replies, not necessarily Twitter replies, but replies uh, around the topics that they cared about. So there were two uh, different uses that emerged. So 
more of that in the paper. Uh, let me go to the next system that kind of was motivated by uh, the first round of, uh, uh, that, uh, of, of work that we did with Vox. And I think it was at when we started working on Vox and later on uh, uh, we introduced different events to it, like uh, the drop in tornadoes and other events that were not necessarily news media events, and realized that there is an interest in not just the tweet, but using the people posting the tweet as a source of more information. So here, uh, the idea around the system called Saucer is how, we can, how can we help uh, the journalists identify knowledgeable sources about breaking news events that are remote. Right? So I'm, at the New, I'm the New York Times reporter, I sit in New York, something is breaking in Joplin, or in Boulder, or uh, in UC Davis, and I'm trying to understand what's going on. Social media not only sh gives me the information, but also identifies people, potentially identifies people I can refer to for more uh, information and contact. So we had uh, a set of design requirements generated in, with a small set of uh, interviews with journalists and social media editors in various newspapers, and we came up with a set of features that can help uh, in the context of you know, identifying sources. So one that we uh, uh, did uh, some work on was eyewitness detection. So extract, extract information from social media about who, uh, by your post, whether you're likely to be an eyewitness, actually there on the ground when something is breaking and happening. Uh, the other signal that we looked at was network embeddedness, so how embedded you are in the network of people posting about this event as a sign of, uh, of you know, knowledge, a, symbol, a signifier of knowledge. Uh, we had a user type classifier that uh, tried to understand if you're an ordinary person or it's a corporate account or it's uh, a, a, news, uh, a media journalist account uh, that was posting. And we also looked at uh, location embeddedness, so how embedded you are uh, in the location where the event was breaking. So for example, if uh, uh, the event is in Joplin, we looked at the, in, in your personal network, how many contacts you have in Joplin. The more uh, contacts you have, the more embedded you are, the more likely you are to be knowledgeable about that situation and that location. So this is what uh, it looked like, and uh, you know, I'm, just as a warning, these are visual analytics interfaces, not visualizations, right, they're not meant for consumers, but they're meant for professionals who interact with this content. Um, so the cues here that are provided are what I discussed, plus a few others. So you can see, for example, this is for the Joplin tornado. Uh, the first person here, uh, we thought she was an eyewitness, uh, but she was mostly embedded you know, in the San Francisco network, not so much in uh, Joplin. Uh, the second person, I think we wrongly classified as an ordinary person, even though she uh, clearly states that she is a journalist. Uh, ouch. I think we did better in later versions, not in the screenshot. Um, yeah. So you're trying to infer uh, uh, some attributes of context based on the uh, aspects of their social network. Do you also look at um, sensor content from the tweet? Like, at, at this time, you allow you know, GPS location to be embedded in the... Yeah, so the, the eyewitness uh, classifier had a bunch of signals going to it, including from the content of the tweets. Uh, we also look at the, their history of tweets to see, for example, here we extracted entities, so what kind of ent entities are usually discussed in the tweets and so forth. Yeah? I was curious as to whether you, you looked at the sort of style of the, you know, the, the style of the text of the tweet. One of the things that uh, uh, some other work recently has, has noticed is that experts in the field or Thor, people who are speaking authoritatively tend to use different words than everybody, you know, than the, the average person. Yeah. Maybe that's something that might Great question, and yes, we looked a little bit at, uh, at the style, linguistic style, in fact, and we looked at the uh, uh, different categories of words that are used by, that was one of the features for a classifier, but I'd love to talk more about that if there are other ideas. Um, all right, so what did we do uh, here in terms of uh, evaluation? We actually wanted to not just evaluate if we, uh, if we built the right thing, and you'll be happy to know that I'm running on reserve battery power. Uh, we wanted to use this as a type of uh, a technical inquiry to uh, actually learn about their current practices 
and what they do around sourcing information for social media, uh, in addition to understanding how, thank you, uh, in addition to understanding how they would use and interact with the system that we have built. So Nick actually talked to a bunch of top writers and social media editors, including from uh, uh, the Washington Post, uh, the New York Daily News, uh, Reuters, uh, The Guardian UK and others. And the results did fit into two different practices, so two distinct or other two distinct practices that they have. One is the need of, of finding and filtering information uh, according to sources and individuals that they, they do not have in current social media systems. They can search by content a lot, but not, by, not as easily by uh, sources. Uh, they were, of course, suspicious of the eyewitness classifier. They were like, oh, this will be amazing, but we're not sure it's going to work. Uh, so there's obviously some work that needs to be done there in helping uh, either building a perfect classifier or helping mitigate their concerns in their interface or otherwise. Um, and then the assessment was indeed important uh, for them, so they, that's definitely one of the practices, and they talked about how they assess so sources and verity. Uh, for example, that they said, if, they, if I find someone who has 50% of uh, their followers in, in Joplin, then I know I'll immediately look at that. I'll definitely uh, try to approach that guy. Um, the location embeddedness uh, was uh, kind of a mixed bag. They sometimes didn't care so much about embeddedness in that city, especially when some things were more remote, talking about bias, or like, oh, in Egypt, I don't care if they're embedded in Cairo, show me if they're embedded in the country, if they know what's, uh, what's going on there. So we're not clear at what resolution this needs to be presented, maybe multiple resolutions uh, to actually be uh, useful. So this was Sourcer. Uh, let me show you the other project. And again, I, I chose today to give you a scan of the different, uh, different systems that we build. And this project organizes social media, or as we called it before, human experiences, in a new way. It's, it's more consumer-based and not, uh, not aimed at professional. Our research question for this project was quite simple. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, you know, what are people doing, right? People are going to the concert. They're putting up, you know, they're taking themselves out of, the, out of the experience. They hold the camera without moving for a whole minute. Uh, they record video, you know, they push it to YouTube. So we're interested, uh, first of all, to understand their practices, the motivations in doing that. Uh, and we had uh, a really nice paper uh, published in New Media and Society that talked about the differences between uh, people who record in indie shows, small scale events, versus uh, people who record and share videos from large-scale, uh, big, uh, kind of, uh, um, like, big, uh, uh, popular band events. And the second thing, so I'm proud of this work because we published part of it in New Media Society and part of it in IEEE Multimedia uh, Journal. Um, so the second part, we, we talked about their, the experience and how the resultant experience is broken. And why is it broken? Let's say I want to see Stevie Wonder in Outside Land, so I type that into YouTube. I get a page of result, results. I mean, not just one page. In fact, just not, not just one screen. Another screen, and another screen, and another one, and there are seven more of those uh, that I can look through if I had all the time in the world. Um, so these are many repeating videos of the same moment. Uh, some are not relevant, some are not interesting, some are bad quality. So we wanted to have a way that will improve the experience around this video that gets shared and created. Oh, I forgot to show you that I'm not impressed. <laughs> um, so there was uh, the key insight that uh, drove this uh, work, the technical insight, uh, is that we can extract the signal. A lot of people are telling us we're paying attention to something uh, by putting their camera up, camera up, capturing and sharing, right? They're telling us we're paying attention to something and we think other people will want to pay attention to it because we're sharing it. Uh, and the way we modeled that attention was uh, we found the overlapping moment uh, that were shared and then we can rank the scenes and extract the scene descriptors based on that, on the, on the mutual attention that's given. And the way that we did that was uh, using a powerful technical idea called uh, audio fingerprinting. 
How many people here have used Shazam or similar systems? So Shazam works in a similar way. The idea that Shazam is, uh, uh, you hear, you're in the bar, there's some great music playing, you're like, oh, what is this? And you put your phone uh, up and it records 10 seconds of the, of the music, sends it to the Shazam server, and it extracts uh, audio fingerprints from it. The fingerprints are basically little markers. Uh, this is looking at the uh, audio signal, little, little markers of the peaks in the frequency and the differences between, uh, the time differences between uh, adjacent uh, peaks. So we don't need to go into the technical details, but the idea is that if we have two tracks that are the same, they will have a lot of the same signature, a lot of the same fingerprints in them. So we can tell that uh, so Shazam can tell that the noisy recording that you have at the bar actually has a lot of peaks in common with some song that they have in a database. In our case, we don't have a song, a set of songs in a database because it's a live event, but we can tell that a lot of fingerprints that somebody had in the track that they uploaded also appear in another track that somebody uploaded. Um, it usually looks like uh, this if I compare two, two, uh, two clips here. Uh, this is the time of the first one, this is the time of the, of the second clip, and there'll be a lot of different matches, a lot of different fingerprints that are the same uh, at different points of time in the two clips. But if they are really a match, then I will see that with an offset of 18 uh, seconds, uh, there are a lot of matches in fingerprints that are always, you know, eight, always 18 seconds apart. Actually, they, it looks like this, right? So. If these are the two clips and I look at the fingerprints, I can see that there are a lot of matches that are exactly 18 seconds away from each other. Then the next thing I can do is, of course, fix the time. So now I know that exactly how uh, the, the two clips may line up. We can also uh, do it, so now we have two synchronous videos. We have a large group of videos for Stevie Wonder from Outside Lands, so we can do it for all of them, and we start to get uh, more clip, uh, clips uh, lined up. The interesting thing about this is when you actually, when you do this, you can start extracting more information about what was going on, like uh, scene information. So you can see very, you can probably guess here that, you know, there are two different things that happened, right? So there's one, perhaps, song that was being played, and then it ended and a bunch of people stopped recording, and then another <coughs> song started and a bunch of people put their camera, ba camera back up while two people were just standing there for 10 minutes until their arms <laughs> fell off. Um, so, so that's one uh, uh, thing, the scene information. And the other uh, piece of information we can get from this is uh, descriptors. So while every uh, YouTube video, the metadata uh, that's associated with it may be suspect, when we look at the group of videos, we can start seeing that uh, and this group is uh, more associated with the terms happy birthday or birthday, and this other group is uh, more associated with higher grounds or people saying, oh, the anchor just started. So now we can use the, the information together, group together, to extract more uh, relevant, uh, more useful descriptors for each of these, these uh, scenes. Let me actually show you uh, an example, so we use that information to uh, plug it into an interface. So the added benefit to all that extra information is you can actually play the videos that were taken at the same time in the interface at the same time. So you can see here that's Conan O'Brien at the Radio City, but I'm going to show you a couple of other events. Um, and I think uh, this might be a little broken now. So not the perfect experience. First of all, you can see that uh, this is the time alignment information of the different videos. Uh, and can you guess where the song, the track is about to start, when they're actually <laughs> going to start playing? Uh, so it's, you know, it's very, it's very clear from the video. This is MGMT. Who knows MGMT? Fans? fans? Uh, this is the famous, you, you recognize everybody, I think, heard this track. They're playing in Chile here. Let me just jump here. This is a little broken right now, but... But if the Wi-Fi will allow me... <laughs> uh, I can switch between, you know, the guy that 
can't stop dancing. Um, and the guy that's more remote but gets the whole picture. And see, uh, see, there's something with YouTube. You see the thumbnails kind of, they want to appear, but they're not quite there. Anyway, let me stop this. Uh, so, this is for a, a music event. It also it could work, you know, for other events. So this is the famous uh, pepper spray, the infamous pepper spray event at UC Davis. And what you see here uh, is, is really interesting because this guy on his video is actually says skip to four or five when police prepare to pepper spray. But we actually know when you know shit is going to hit the fan. Uh, <laughs> and so if I, I can just jump here. Here, right, let me play that first. Uh, and you can see that he's gonna start shaking his can. This is actually too difficult to watch, so I'm gonna stop it, but, uh, but you, can start to, you can see that things are starting to happen just, or maybe in this video. Yeah, here's the, he starts shaking, and you know, the spraying is gonna begin in a second. So, um, the interesting thing about that event is they had, you know, the, the media was not there. I mean, the social media was there, and there were tweets shared, and there were photos shared, and there were those videos that popped up uh, uh, even the same day or day later. So the, how did you get the alignments there? Because there was no sound. There was, uh, so there's some sound, but it's less uh, robust for, oh, the, uh, for this track. So the, uh, the, there are other techniques, and people have been working on uh, alignment for non-music information. So, but it's definitely, it's definitely a harder task. Uh, Conan O'Brien. So obviously what we have here is we have uh, no redundancy. We know what the interesting moments are because we can group the scenes together and know what more people told us is interesting. Uh, and this actually gets better when more content is added, right? The YouTube, you know, the seven pages that I get you when one new video is added, you're never going to see it, but here it gives us more information. You're going to see it if it actually covers the moment that you want to see. Uh, there's also a way for us, for us to use that information to uh, get uh, higher quality, uh, uh, find the higher quality uh, uh, videos in, in, uh, in a set, in a scene. So uh, here, uh, as I mentioned before, we directly evaluated the output, the output of the uh, interface, uh, the, the, the matching, the keywords that were extracted, the quality, uh, all those indicators. And we also had a qualitative study where we brought, uh, uh, in lab settings here, when we brought people in and, and had them interact with the system to see how the, the multi-view plays out, you know, what, what does it give them over the regular viewing experience. So a few examples of the results, people, uh, thought that it helped them feel what it was like to be there in the crowd. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you're Ticketmaster, you probably, you know, you want to show them if, or if you assume people will want to uh, go after they know what it is uh, in the crowd, you probably want to sh uh, show that. Uh, people understood the level of interest indicators and, and, and thought that was meaningful, but they also wanted to take uh, control. They wanted to see all those videos, but then make an edit or make a clip that shows them that just takes the best angles at any uh, given time. But perhaps we can do computationally, but people de definitely felt the need to do it uh, uh, themselves. Uh, there was an issue with the varied uh, audio quality. If, uh, it was hard to notice here because of slight delay, but the audio is really different between the different tracks, but that's also something that can be uh, fixed. I'm uh, almost out of time. But let me just uh, uh, quickly wrap up and show you uh, a quick other demo. Um, but looking at events in social media, I think it's, uh, it's, it's more interesting to put in context when you think about what if we had this you know, for 50 years now, right? What if we can actually go back to the night when Will Chamberlain scored 100 points, something I care about, and, uh, or uh, Janis Joplin's first ever concert, uh, or Ben's first talk, you know? <laughs> who, would, who would not like to see that? Uh, so all of these will be possible in the future. We are recording our present in, in a way that's unprecedented, and, and if we build the right tools to archive and find those experiences, we'll be able to go back. I don't know if it's good or bad yet, but we will be able to go back and re-experience it in a different ways. So let me just show you a quick preview of, my, uh, uh, of how we took a lot of this work and applied this, or 
at least uh, starting to apply this in, in other uh, more commercial settings. So here, this is just a quick demo that we put together. The idea of uh, you know outside lands. Right now, it's all you know the content is all over the place. So what we do here is we put it on on one page. Uh, so if you want, you know, this content is archived and available. Although you probably don't want to see all the twenty thousand tweets and photos that are archived and available. So we actually automatically create uh, summaries of the event. So we have the algorithm that extracts the key topics and the key moments uh, that happened during that time. So you can see here, uh, outside lands, it's a music festival right? San Francisco. People are excited in the morning when it starts. Uh, then Tan Lines opens, Reggie Watts uh, plays, and the, the photos, I can add uh, Flickr photos as well. Yeah. Um, the Walkman plays. <coughs> Uh, you know, I can I can scroll down. You can think about adding, you know, the YouTube videos and all that to create uh, the experience as it was viewed and shared by the people that were there. Um, here is Stevie Wonder. Um, we did that for uh, Hurricane Sandy. You probably all remember that too. But uh, you know, here is just a quick reminder. This is uh, mostly New York, so. The night of Hurricane Sandy, people you know, first worried about food and dinner. Uh, then they were collecting candles. The first thing that happened was the 8th Avenue building uh, collapsing. And then lights started flickering. Uh, you know, the blackout occurred. And then Lower Manhattan flooded, and the hospital got evacuated. Right? So this all you know, just came from, from, from the data, right, from people reporting their experiences in a distributed way and us making uh, sense of it and, and presenting it in a new way. Uh, did anyone go to, South, uh, to CSCW? So, you know, tell me if we can, we can capture that experience here. So, again, this is uh, instead of, I missed it this year, it's one of my favorite conferences. Uh, and instead of reading through, I think it was like 1,500 tweets, uh, I, we just create this automatic summary. So apparently, Sepp gave a keynote at the workshop, and then Ron Burt, highly recommended speaker. If you haven't uh, seen him, he talked about networks uh, in his keynote of the conference. There was a panel about filter bubble, uh, Butler lies. Mary's paper got uh, uh, got a good response. So I guess I should take a look at it. There was a discussion of acceptance rate, as always. Uh, <laughs> Moon Moon got a good response, that same Moon Moon that uh, helped us do the eyewitness work that I mentioned before. And then one of the big highlights was that they discussed the group lens paper from 1994. So that, John, I promised you you'll see that uh, here now. So, and I can uh, actually click into that and see what, uh, what people said about uh, that presentation. Um, and this can all be also be done for live events. This is going on right now. Uh, this is the launch festival. So I can see what uh, uh, this is going on right now in San Francisco. So I can follow this event, these events live without having to press the mute button, Jen, and <laughs> in, uh, in my social media feed because I don't want to see all the posts about these. I just want just give me the highlights. OK, now really wrapping up quickly. Um, so uh, essentially, we're trying to you know, create uh, better models of this large scale of human attention and to per persist and archive that in, in a meaningful way. Um, does anyone know Ma Martha Ballard? Uh, so, there's a, a book by Laurel uh, Thatcher Ulrich that uh, she's a Harvard historian. This a woman named Martha Ballard who's been writing uh, her diary of her daily experiences uh, in the late 18th century, early 19th century. And uh, very short tweet-like entries, right? And this essentially, this diary revolutionized the way that uh, people have done history of that, of that period. And Martha Ballard actually does have a Twitter account right now where they post the little updates that she posted uh, a few hundred years ago. Uh, <laughs> but now we are the Martha Ballards, right? And future historians will look at our tweets and information to understand society, our society, in a, in a new way. So uh, 
our questions is how, uh, what kind of tools we can keep creating for scientists, for journalists, for, uh, for consumers to allow access and make sense of that data beyond just reliving of uh, events. Um, you know, we're up to two different things. One, that we'll have scholars collect, explore, and analyze this data that's called Socrates, and one that helps us look at information from cities over a 5, 10, or 20 year uh, period and understand how the temporal patterns uh, can teach us about life in those cities and about changes of life in those cities. So I don't always quote Marxist philosophers, but when I do, uh, <laughs> I usually put them at the end of my talk. Uh, <laughs> so I'd like to thank my collaborators, and maybe we have time for a few questions. <laughs> Here they come. <laughs> <laughs> Megan? Is that, I'm not going to try to say the name of it. Is that site with the live feeding of events? Is that live? Can people, is that up? Uh, we'll be live uh, in beta later this week. So if you email me, I can add you to the list. So how would you pronounce the name? <laughs> yeah, true. Well, Mahaya is the Hebrew way to say it, but Mahaya is how <laughs> others will say it. So I become, it insults the Hebrew in me, but I, I started saying Mahaya myself. And Mahaya in Hebrew <laughs> means? I, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Mahaya means what happened. So, uh. yeah. so th your question is really fascinating about how, how to sort of categorize or capture um, events as they're unfolding with the volume of data that we have today. And in the past, of course, you know, like the Dewey system or whatever, those, are, those categories are imposed on physical objects and are easier to track. The thing that I'm curious about is, you know, your thoughts on the difference between the sorts of, say, joint attentional events that you can capture uh, and analyze now because there's so much video, and the sorts of things that are, say, in that 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 library picture of the library. A lot of those volumes are about things or ideas that don't. In, that they're almost the opposite. That, that, that one individual or a small group of individuals collaborated and came up with an idea and documented those in this volume. So it's much more Wikipedia-like from mm -hmm. our perspective, right? Right. So I'm curious about your, your ideas of the difference between the nature of that kind of data that uh, has been systematically categorized and your overall goal of like how do we, how do we categorize today's knowledge, but, but the difference between the sort of the joint attentional events, which are a very different kind of object yeah. uh, than the sorts of things that have been categorized in the past. I mean. Is there something missing here that we're not categorizing, or you know, wh wh where do you see it going? Yeah, that's an interesting question. That I I don't have all the answers. I think the unit of analysis question is is uh, interesting here, right? So, what kind of unit of analysis? So, are we are looking at individual tweets, at individual moment in time? We're looking maybe a body of tweets that's perhaps more similar. So, if we look at all the tweets from a city, is that a story that's being told at the same level of a book, uh, perhaps? Uh, or from a community or from a conference, right? So now it becomes uh, a wider uh, source of information. You can compare, say, one conference to another in terms of the production that was made there, uh, like perhaps you try to, in, in what you build here. Uh, and you can start reason at, at that level. But I think the unit of analysis can, can differ uh, and depends on what, uh, what you're trying to find in your study. Another, uh, perhaps a more something you can do for both book or any kind of written language is language level analysis. And I think the way the Google Books project have shown how we can do language level analysis with books over you know, hundreds of years, we can also do it over social media, over whatever data we have, but like we did for the web. But you have exceedingly more information about the context in which things were posted and, and the authorship and who talked about what and where and when so you can have much richer models of you know, language, for example, if that's what you care about. So I think there are, you know, the, the unit of analysis can, can vary according to what you're interested in, but there are, there are defin definitely equivalents. Well, I, have a, I have a comment I wanted to make, actually. The, I, I, over the weekend, I went to the Smithsonian's Museum of American Art, where there's the exhibit about Namjoon Pike, the video uh, innovator. And it's an exhibit worth seeing, just understanding how uh, 30, 40 years ago, this creative person began to use the media. But as I strolled through, I, I went uh, through the section, and it was a talk about 
Thomas Edison and uh, the inventors of the time. They were seeing the basics for them. It was light and uh, electricity and and mechanism, and they were making you know phonographs and they were making video and creating these different, taking the different streams and making new devices. And I think we're very much at a time where that's happening now. And you're showing the way in which. You know, we think about, oh, we do Twitter analysis, or we do Flickr analysis, or we do YouTube analysis. But actually, the integrated approach that you show enables us to create something totally new that provides insights and understandings that I think are very powerful. Mm -hmm. Last week here, the Personal Digital Archiving uh, Conference also addressed these issues about how we, in this century, how do we look at, how do we now bring narrative and uh, the, the kind of understanding of archive, of story, of history, to work in the technology-centered world. And I think you've shown very clever things here that um, really get me thinking about the ways that these different, me the, that these different sources can be, can be used to create a new experience that no one else experienced at all mm -hmm. and, and give you insight that wasn't available to any, even the people who were there at the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very powerful notion. Uh, Bill. Well, I can actually build off that a little bit. I was just curious, what do you see the role of, of curation in a world yeah. that we can just do auto-summarization <laughs> Yeah, great question. Uh, and I think there'll be still, uh, there'll still be a lot of room for curation. I think journalists, the media, right, whenever I talk to journalists or media people, they're, they're scared. They're like, oh my God, the algorithm, you know, what are we going to do? Uh, or they take the completely different approach, like, oh, no algorithm can ever tell us, you know, what's important. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think there'll be, uh, we actually, we showed, uh, what I just showed you, we showed at the New York Times uh, last week. And they were, uh, they both were interested and had insights about what can make the algorithms better in you know, putting uh, outcomes. So I think the, the, art, the, the curation can happen both in working with journalists and information professionals to improve the algorithms and allow them, give them the right set of tools to pick from what we, uh, or find more, right, and, and expose that. I see some more hands coming. Let's take one more of these. Yeah, so with the multiplayer app that you showed, when you're already doing synchronization with time in order to allow people to experience an event in an interesting or, or different way, it seems like you, you're already one step towards being able to do 3D reconstruction of the scene. Yeah. You've, already, you've already synced up the, the, the video. It wouldn't be that much harder to take it to the next step and say, well, now we know where the frames are. We can build an actual 3D reconstruction of a concert as it, as it happens. Or, based on YouTube, and then you could really experience the concert in a new and different way, because you can move around yeah. the auditorium yeah. basically at will, using information you almost already have. Yeah, it, it, uh, famous last word, it wouldn't be that hard. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I, th I think you're right. Actually, there, there's work. I'm, 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 uh, I'm joking, of course. There's, uh, there's work actually at SIGGRAPH that was already, already done. It turns out it's a really difficult problem, not, unlike Photosynth. Uh, they use stationary cameras and try to reconstruct the, the 3D based on that. And, and it, so there are baby steps that are starting to happen in that direction. Uh, the second thing I want to say is it was definitely something that came out of the user study. People said, I want to know, you know where the person was uh, you know, taking that video, right? where they were sitting, right? and, and kind of move through that scene actually by knowing where the people were. Uh, which is perhaps possible, but just uh, if you don't want to create the, the full 3D live uh, thing, uh, Noah Snavely's work at Cornell actually looks at localizing uh, your point of view based on the, on the picture. Right? It could be a still picture. And the third thing I want to say about that is that we when we, we called this project, uh, when we were working in Rutgers, we called it uh, Relive. And the assumption was that in 15 years, you can literally, literally relive this event by stepping into this virtual environment that we recreated that was based on that, uh, based on those videos, and perhaps you know, see the tweets around you, or whatever that is, and feel like you were there when the information was produced. All right, I think we're going to end the show here. If one of those who want to continue, come up front and talk. But thanks again for. Thank you, Beth. Really nice thing.